Right, good evening everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be talking to you, although it's a very strange experience I find doing these these talks on Zoom because you haven't got the audience reaction, you haven't really got that face to face because if I try and look at everyone I shall get totally distracted. The talk this evening is Ships Timbers. Um, I shall try and make it relevant to vernacular buildings. Um, Mary, <laughs> that wasn't a, something I heard of before. Um, anyway, never mind. Um, ships Timbers. So I thought I would start by showing you plenty of Ships Timbers because I'm afraid in this talk you're not going to see very many. Um, this is the reconstruction of the Mary Rose, which you probably know as uh, a wreck discovered after um, being buried for oh, 400, 500 years um, in the seashore and has been restored and brought back to life so you can actually go and visit. But my talk is going to be about um, ships, timbers and uh, or alleged ship's timbers. And just to give you the kind of idea of what you can actually see when you go out and about, you can find a number of buildings that say that, like here in Congleton at the Lion and Swan, it was built from reclaimed ship's timbers with wattle and daub infill. Another one, uh, Mayflower's Barn in Jordan in Buckinghamshire, <coughs> is a barn that is meant to have been built uh, from the timbers from the Mayflower. Now the Mayflower, of course, took the Pilgrim Fathers to America, or took some people from this country to America. Um, and studying it in the, I think it was in the 1920s, um, a chap called J. Randall Harris discovered or came to the conclusion through his careful study of the building, that the cracked timbers that he saw in it meant that because the Mayflower people had mentioned they were very worried by the sound the ship made as it was going across the sea and they realised that one of the timbers was cracked, uh, this probably is the barn that was built for the, uh, oh, from the timbers of the Mayflower. It's called the cracked beam theory because of that very reason that, that um, the people on the Mayflower actually talked about the cracked beam. A third building, um, this time not far from Preston. It's a private building, you can't go nosing around yourself. But he said when salt samples of the wood were scientifically examined, they were found to have a, a high salt content and were much older than the house. Perhaps they were ship's timbers that had been recycled. This incidentally also has the honour of being most haunted house uh, allegedly in Britain, certainly in Lancashire. And so it has this kind of dual notoriety as being a building with ship's timbers and being completely haunted. A bit nearer to my home, there's this rather um, handsome pub in the village of Norwood Green, just outside Halifax. And that proudly proclaims on its website that the timbers in the pub, and they do look old if you go into the pub for a pint or when you can go into the pub, um, the timbers do look old, were partly involved in repelling the Armada. Of course the Armada was uh, around our shores in 1588 but this building I would say is probably from the 18th century at its very earliest. Um, but the name the Old White Bear is indeed the name of one of the ships that uh, was involved in defeating the Armada and actually was broken up in 1624, but it was broken up at the uh, dockyard in Deptford um, and it's quite a long way from Deptford up to Halifax. We'll probably come back to that theme a bit later on. So I do a fair bit of recording of buildings, um, particularly older buildings, and quite often when we first arrive to do our kind of preliminary look around the building, we get the owner will look around and look up at the beams which we hopefully have in there or at least we have um, beams in the roof and will say that these are ship's timbers and I shall adopt my kind of quizzical air when I when I hear that um, kind of it's a kind of mixture of politeness and um, incredulity and I raise my eyebrows um, and I ask well why are these ship's timbers? Um, and then the various answers come that it's to do with their size or it's to do with their shape or it's to do 
with these holes or these cutouts and things that don't have much purpose or it's to do with those strange markings those are i'd say the in that roughly in that kind of order so let's have a little look at um, some of the timbers that they might have been talking about and first of all i take on i just show you this barn in near chorley i um i'm sorry i can't remember who um shared this picture with me maybe kevin illingworth in, in which case my apologies kevin if i'm not crediting you um but this is a, a, an example where you could well imagine that people would think this might be ship's timbers i mean and indeed for two reasons one of course is just the massive size of the timbers there but also the crook frame does give it that kind of appearance of an upside down boat so yeah why not why couldn't this be ship's timbers our second one is from a roof I was invited to look at in South Yorkshire, a place, a little village called Carlcoats, um, a tiny place, really a hamlet, um, a church, and the, this house is there. And there we have, of course, a very good example of a timber that has something in it that clearly is serving no purpose at the moment, and it's uh, obviously been cut out and there are holes in it. And if you get your eye in, you can see there are several more, one over there in that timber over there, one or two pegs poking out here, and indeed another thing there. Um, so they've clearly come from somewhere else, um, and maybe there was a ship. Our third one is from a survey we did in Cumbria, in Dent, a bit of old Yorkshire really. Um, and this one of very interesting timber, not only has it got a halving and its peg sitting there, redundant. It's also got one in its other face as well. Um, so we've got a very interesting piece of timber indeed. And you know, we may be trying to be able to find out perhaps where that came from. And from a crawling into the roof space of this building in Steeton in Yorkshire, we found various different bits of marking. The circled ones um, are markings. Roman little Roman numerals, uh, a one there on its side and a two. But we also have other rather strange markings on the building, on the timber as well. A line going across there, another line going across there, one coming down here, more lines going that way. Um, and the kind of question is, well, what could those be associated with as well? I just point out that this line going down here does seem to be lining up with something else a bit later on. We'll visit this building again a bit later on. Um, in a house I, I surveyed over in, in Lancashire, a place called Chevington, it had these very unusual looking markings on the building, on and under the timbers inside it. There were several of them, and we'll see one or two more a bit later. Apparently a 15 or a one and a five on two separate timbers that were joined together. Um, and then we have some of the more mysterious looking markings you can get on timbers as well, um, sometimes called Baltic timber markings. Um, looking at them at first sight, um, difficult to make any sense of them. And indeed, some of them, you, <laughs> I must have been, I challenge, I'm challenged to make any sense of them at all. Um, but as you'll see a bit later on, these may be markings that would identify a bit of timber from a ship, but they also may be markings um, that show that the source of the timber or the quality of the timber when it was transported over from the Baltic ports. Okay, so let's examine how you actually get um, from a growing tree to a timber. I thought I found this little charming little illustration of uh, cutting down trees and starting to transport them away on the, the left hand side there from uh, a children's magazine in the from the 1870s and I thought it I mean it illustrates really nicely the chopping down of the trees um, strange little people being involved in it and rather a giant um, boss standing here with typical pose hanging up hands and its shoulders but we also have illustrations from medieval period um, and these illustrations quite often show uh, carpenters in this case at work um, in this case he's using his, his auger there but you can see quite a few other instruments of his trade sitting around there the side axe is sitting here um, so on and he's clearly working on a frame of some sort and probably a frame for a building um, and this wonderful picture uh, um, actually from um, a book of hours, in other words, a Christian devotional book, um, shows uh, some workmen chopping away merrily at some wood and preparing timber. You can see another auger in the foreground here, 
another side X going on here. Um, and in the middle here, we have none other than Noor giving instructions as to how the timber should be put together, because here we are, believe it or not, constructing Noah's Ark, genuine ship's timbers from the medieval period. <clears throat> well, what are those people doing? They're taking the trunks that we saw cutting, cut down in the earlier slide, of, and what they're starting to do is prepare those trunks of trees for actual use um, in a building, or in a ship, of course. Um, and these Next illustration is I pinched from uh, a very interesting article written by uh, um, and his colleague Russ, Russell for Vernacular Architecture number 26 in 1995. And I just flipped through these reasonably quickly. But you can see they put their um, tree trunk on a pair of trestles and they're ready to actually make do some work on it and after their first stage is to do some lining up and to start carving off the um, part of the outside of the tree and the bark and so on and to obtain a relatively square cut here and you can see they're using a kind of plumb bob here um, and they will have achieved this by using the side axes we, that we saw in the earlier medieval uh, illustration um, and chopped away here and we'll see in a minute why they're doing this and they've made some markings there, squaring, squaring markings. Um, here we are, there they are, they've done that side, they can now turn the bit of timber over, use their plumb bob again and here we are and you can see this process goes on until we have resulted in a very oh, a relatively squared up piece of timber, quite suitable for use now um, in construction. But what you get out of that quite often is this marking that um, remains on the face of the timber and indeed appears when you uh, look carefully at buildings. The hard way of doing it with a saw, um, a frame saw, um, going through a trunk sitting on there on a trestle tree. Um, this is um, the author of this book uh, called Wooden Walls was certain that this timber was going for a ship and they're carving, they're cutting through it. You see, it's a wonderfully curved bit of timber. I would guess that could make quite a nice crook as well. So I've talked about crooks and I've, um, there are the second type of um, timber frame building or second basic type, post and truss, sometimes called a box frame building. Um, one basic difference in them um, is that the crook frame building is, pit, is created by these pairs of blades, as they're called, um, and they support uh, the roof of the building. Um, and that leaves you free to do more or less what you like with the structural sides of the building. They're not structural in, in that sense at all. In contrast, a post and trust building or box frame building, that frame there is crucial in supporting the roof. And you can see on the right hand side there, the roof is being supported on this timber here with a wall plate, and that in turn is being held together with the tie beams. So basically two forms of um, timber frame building and we'll look at each of them in turn to get some idea of you know, the kind of timbers that will be used in them. First of all we'll start then by the with the um, framed building and here we see from um, Jane Grenville's book on medieval housing um, I've borrowed this uh, illustration which it shows very well. Um, the work um, involved in setting out a frame. This is a gable end frame as you can see. It's going to sit eventually on this wall, this low walling here, a dwarf wall as she's described it. The ground seal here is one piece of timber and these are all separate pieces of timber that are being put together by our carpenter up here um, and he's busily making, preparing the timber, boring the holes for the pegs that are going to hold the joints together um, and then that timber is going to be used and erected um, and we'll see in a moment how that's going to go along. <clears throat> On the framework what he'll be doing to make sure that the bits of timber go in the right place because of course he has to having set it all out on the floor and jointed it all together he will then take it all apart um, and to ensure the bits go and join up in the right place we have a series of marking and then there are a variety of ways of actually marking 
timbers. Um, the first row underneath, one, two, three, and fairly conventional um, Roman numerals. <clears throat> um, and perhaps to distinguish either side of the frame, he's used a second, I could have used a second set of um, symbols here with a little notch to the side. And they will distinguish the second side of the building. Now, when you're actually putting that building together, well, you start on the ground frame that we saw, and then you start by slotting the timbers in. I and don't Richard think Bond you're going to. I don't. No idea how you cast this. <coughs> Interesting. Well, but, uh, <coughs> you haven't um, got the email on the laptop. <coughs> Never mind. Um, uh, we can uh, see the great Tompkins barn here with um, Richard Bond, article in Vernacular Architecture 24. Um, and here's shown here um, some of the stages in the construction of the building, starting here at the gable end. Um, they've put in some of the intermediate braces, uh, intermediate struts and the braces. Um, the second picture, we're getting some of the larger timbers in and so on through the whole building. And you can see that very complicated analysis to understand how this building was put together. I think in total he made around, I think there are about 30 separate slides till you get to the point where you can actually put that ridge beam in um, and top out the building. Um, and here is the building itself, Great Tompkins Barn. That is what the structure of what we were looking at, what was going on in there. <clears throat> Peter Ryder's book about timber frame buildings in South Yorkshire has a very good illustration, which I've reproduced here, um, of a King Post truss from um, a building in South Yorkshire showing the various different features and various different parts of that building, um, particularly the tie beam and the King Post itself, and then braces up to the roof ridge here. Um, and I just put in on the side here that building we saw in Silsden a few uh, slides ago, just to show that this king post here is indeed the same as this post here. And the markings that we had over here, well, um, we've got a number one, number two, well, they were the equivalents on the uh, king post and joining them to the rafters like this. So we would have a number one and a number two on the rafters to make sure they fit together. The other thing I pointed out very briefly was that we have these lines, these red lines that go across the main part of the king post there. And they are used or were used probably for lining up. So we get our rafters into the correct position um, when we were actually setting the building out. So a bit of an explanation there as to actually what these different timbers are and the parts they play in the roof and a bit of an explanation of the kind of markings that you get. Now Green Lane Archaeology kindly shared, me, uh, shared with me another um, set of markings on a building. These are int intriguing in a way. These could be um, carpenter's marks. They could be apotraic marks, in other words, protection marks, because we do have um, this double V sign here, which is believed to be an apotraic mark. And here we see them again, probably more clearly. This is another one from this building um, in Chevington. You can see on the on the right hand side there, some of the marks, a bit like we saw before. But then we also have these marks here. So a whole range of different things can be shown to be these apotraic marks. There are also other alternatives. I mean, look here, this is a, a, new, a numbering system. Um, but how misleading could it be if you don't know what you're looking for? One, two, three, four, five, looks a bit like a four. What's this one here? Seven, of course, and so on through the, through the numerical ones. <clears throat> and, and this is the house that um, some of those uh, timbers with the circular markings, it's Holland's house in Chevington in Lancashire. Um, and uh, Arnold Pacey, and I did a survey of this building. Here's one of Arnold's drawings just to show how these things fit together. Um, and you can see, I hope, some of the numerals and how they were joining together. Here in a bit more detail, we can see the numbering. Um, and it was very interesting that the, it appeared that this was even a combination of numbering, that we had these small numbers um, there and the uh, Roman numerals on the major struts there. Very interesting. Here's a detail of one of those. Um, and it's 
these numbers in particular, you'll notice we how we just have circular forms here. Um, and here, well, a combination of the circular forms and then simple strokes and that kind of thing. The circular ones are made with a tool called, which we haven't um, looked at yet called a raised knife. And here's a drawing by Arnold to actually how that raised mark actually worked. Now, um, the relevance to the ship's timbers, of course, is that you might find any of those markings or any of those jointing and that kind of thing on um, a vernacular building. Now, uh, here we have the second basic form of a vernacular building, a crook frame building. Um, this is from um, one of the pioneering works on vernacular architecture and a building that was photographed during destruction um, in the early 20th century in the um, hills above Sheffield. This is a crook frame building. In other words, it has it's supported by these crook blades um, with a uh, beam coming across here and then the support of the roof borne totally on these crook blades. And then in Jane's book on medieval housing, we have how these crook blades are actually put together. And as you can see, the method here is quite different to what we saw in a timber frame building that you have on a um, post and trust building that in this case, we put in our frame together on the floor and then we have a fairly um, complicated pulley system and we're going to literally rear the crook, raise the crook up into the vertical position and you can see the chaps busily working on getting their pulley ready and this kind of thing to hoist the, build, the frame up. And this indeed is a, um, a, once the frame was up was a period for some celebration because of course getting that up and then getting uh, the purlins in place to hold the building together was quite, a, quite an achievement. So <clears throat> there are various sorts, various different types of crook building. Um, there's the, just a few of the possible examples that you can have, a full crook, a uh, base crook only comes up to this point here, but the collar runs across, um, a raised crook and so on. There are various different sorts of crook building. They all have this thing um, in common that the roof is supporting on the crook frame. And you think I must have flipped and got a wrong slide in here, but uh, this is a, a petrol station or a, and a MOT testing station, a garage just outside Huddersfield, which um, I was told quite confidently that these were ship's timbers um, just outside Huddersfield. Well, you can't see any ship's timbers at the moment, but if you venture inside through that doorway, here is one of the, some of the most spectacular, <laughs> I think, um, timbers that I've seen in um, a fairly well, in a working building still. Um, and they've built a garage completely around this crook frame building. Um, and you can see here with the framework, here are the crook blades going up here um, and the tie running across there. And you can imagine that these markings and that kind of thing, the mechanics could well believe that this in fact was a timber framed, um, a crook frame, I'll get it right in a minute, a ship. Yeah ships, timbers that have uh, been reused. An amazing shot of the top um, of uh, the joints of the top of those timbers um, and joined together here by these various um, beams running across here. Um, halvings there to join the collars together. Um, and this is, as I said, the upper level of that in that garage. And then by some coincidence, James Walton writing in, in the 1940s, um, also surveyed this building, I guess, be probably before it was um, um, being used as a garage. Um, and here is his drawing from uh, his publication in 1947 of the barn. Uh, it was co actually called Linthwaite Hall Barn. Um, and he believed it was actually the creation of a much older timber frame building called uh, Linthwaite Hall. But the wonderful thing about his drawings was that he actually showed um, some of the joints on a, a full page, one of the details of the carpentry. Here's that um, marking, you remember we saw very early on in the uh, one about actually <coughs> um, making a, a squared piece of timber um, and then a second set of markings showing the jointing between the various uh, points here. Uh, numbers there as well. Um, and this rather interesting support that he's, he said he saw there, I don't remember that they were still in place uh, when we went there. Um, to just illustrate exactly how this might work, um, because several of the buildings that we see nowadays 
um, with timber inside them um, have uh, been composed of older timbers um, from uh, buildings perhaps on the site or perhaps nearby. Um, and I'll just illustrate this by taking this drawing from Peter Ryder's book on the timber frame buildings in South Yorkshire to show that um, and I've, um, shaded in this one crook blade um, and just to show what that crook blade would actually look like um, if you saw it uh, before it was actually um, put in place or better still when you took it out um, and that's the kind of shape and the kind of joints and the kind of um, holes you would get for the pegs and so on so you can imagine that if you cut that up into two pieces or even just use it as it is um, in a building you would get a lot of redundant joints sitting on that building and i'm pretty certain this is why a lot of people think that um, these may have come perhaps from somewhere else they're quite right in that but a lot of people think that um perhaps and perhaps it's because it sounds more romantic that they have actually come from a ship um and we have actually surveyed uh, a barn uh, nearby that does have a complete crook poke crook blade being reused upside down as a post it was a fairly straight piece of crook timber but nonetheless they were using it um as a post <clears throat> and Alison Armstrong one of our colleagues from the vernacular group um has made a speciality of studying these different forms of crook blade and you can see that she has um drawn out these various different shapes and shown how these may come across so from the point of view of looking at a building you have to be very cautious about any claims of ship's timbers here is a possible purlin same way um, from Peter Ryder's drawing this is what a purlin would look like um, when it was taken out of the building um, and you can see that uh, it may well um, give people the impression that it came from somewhere else so I think we need to reassess what we saw say at Flintergill and what we saw at Carlcoats um, to try and get some idea and there we have at Flintergill those opposing uh, halvings that we had uh, from the crook blade um, and a similar kind of thing this may have been a purlin this may have been a blade at Carlcoats so the reuse of timbers quite often can lead to people thinking that, that they've got ship's timbers well are you convinced about all that are these perhaps not ship's timbers after all you've got to imagine yourself as the householder have i convinced you that these these aren't ship's timbers not yet you're still believing that uh, perhaps these could be ship's timbers well i think what we have to do then is to look at a couple of other key points one of them is the actual transport of the timbers and the transport costs now if these are going to be ship's timbers they are going to be have to come from the point at which the ship was dismantled in the dockyard uh, and the timber then reclaimed and then brought to the place where it was reused. Now from most of the examples that I've used the places are a considerable distance not only from the coast but even from any navigable waterways and the estimates have been made that the cost of transport over land of pieces of timber is probably about 10 times as great as it is over water so it's all very well carrying bits of timber from um, shop, uh, ship breakers up the uh, in over the sea and up a river to a, a convenient place to on, offload um, and even carry that timber further upstream on um, a barge but it would be very difficult to actually uh, build or move that timber um, a longer distance or it would be very costly I think is more important the more important point um, and we'd have to also consider the availability of alternative material now to illustrate the the transport of timber um, I've used these a uh, couple of illustrations from a wonderful source for although albeit for early 19th century um, by a this book called the microcosm written um, and illustrated by William Pine um, and if you google that you'll see um, uh, the various different drawings I think altogether there must be about a hundred perhaps more drawings of various different crafts and various different activities and I think these are brilliant because they show you the various different ways in which timber was hauled um, both to and from 
the forest or the woodland where it, to where it was going to be used. Our chaps here have got a very kinky looking bit of wood raised onto their wagons. Um, of course, quite often um, you would just be using a pair, a pair, two pairs of wheels to carry the longer timbers. Um, and this is these are one of some of the ways in which timber could be moved about over land. But as you can imagine, that is a pretty slow process. Um, I couldn't find pine, an illustration in pine of a horse just actually dragging timber through the woodland, but that, that is also, was also a common way and it still is a common way of moving timbers um, through the forests. So our second stage of the journey, if you're thinking of going from um, the woodland to uh, the dockyard, our second stage of the jury, jury, as soon as possible, you get your timber onto a ship um, and travel by water. It's a tenth of the cost a mile of actually going from taking the uh, by road. So I'm just going to give you some examples now of where ship's timbers actually have been used. Um, I hope um, if you're imaginary, your imaginary householder that I've convinced you, but maybe not. Well, so I'll show you some of the buildings where ship's timbers can be used and you can go and look at some of them and get an idea of the kind of way they might have been used. I've got four examples which I have to illustrate here. Um, they are easy, all easily accessible in non-COVID times. On the left we have uh, the uh, 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 in Chatham Dockyard, um, one of the fairly recently discovered uh, reuse of ship's timbers. Um, on the top right we have Liberties in London, um, documented as being having been built from ships timbers uh, in the 1920s. On the left, uh, we have a, a local building for me, the what's now the Ship Inn in Brighouse, um, and the, the Tap and Spile were in Halifax. Just to look at that in a bit more detail, this is called this is at Chatham Dockyard, and it's called the Wheelwright Shop. Um, and it's from the outside a fairly uh, interesting uh, but I'm slightly unusual building um, in a, one of the many buildings in the dockyard. But when they came to examine it, they found, on, as you can see in the larger image, that it was full of timbers. And of course, being in a dockyard, they could be they were reused timbers. Um, a fair amount of detailed analysis was done on these timbers and if you look at the way they've been reused in the floor there it seemed they were like they were almost determined to use every little bit of timber that they could out of the Namur. They didn't want anything to go to waste um, and they laid the floor out here um, and covered it with planking um, and after considerable analysis and a lot of investigation they came to the conclusion they could actually pin down the ship from which it came, the HMS Namur, which is a ship which was uh, launched, I think, in the middle of the uh, 18th century and broken up about 40 years later. Part of that analysis was actually looking at some of the markings, and that's why I've spent a fair bit of time talking about the markings, because these markings were some of the ones that they found on the Namur, um, and the markings are quite particular. You'll notice we've got fairly conventional Roman numerals here, but we have put a large S beside it. And if you find unusual markings um, with large letters beside them uh, like that, um, an S or a, for starboard or an L for larboard in particular, they are almost certainly, they almost are certainly ship's timbers. Um, another uh, one uh, taken from Dan Atkinson's very interesting book on ship yards and timber management. You've really got to look at these sources to get some idea. Um, and a fragment of a, a futtock, some of the words for timber, a top timber from the hull framing. And the, this one is very interesting in that we have um, a bolt through it to start with, to attach it to the rest of the timber, and then what appear at first sight to be fairly indiscriminate markings on it, in fact tells you which a ship this came from. And if you look carefully, you can see there that it actually spells out victory. So those, ba those Baltic timber marks I spoke about earlier, they may be slightly more complicated than we thought. I th I'm sure quite a lot of them are Baltic timber marks, um, which were used for uh, quality control and were used for um, 
identification of the source of timbers that were brought over from the board. But they got these kind of timbers um, or markings on these timbers as well. And they then, I'm pretty certain we could say they were with confidence, they were ship's timbers. Our second example, the, uh, the Liberty store in London. Um, the founder of Liberty started off with a much smaller building around the corner of this one. Um, and this is the uh, main facade or part of the main facade on Great Northumberland Street. Um, and uh, if you haven't been to the building, I mean, I'm not getting a cut from Liberty's, but maybe I should. Um, they, it is well worth a visit because you can see very clearly these timbers and it is a wonderful arts and crafts um, interior. The, it was designed by the uh, father and son team of Edwin and, and Edwin Hall um, and they re recycled timbers from two ships. One was called HMS Howe, um, became later on in its life the impregnable and this is what happened to quite a lot of um, timber ships the uh, timber warships that um, after they were used after say 10, 15, 20 years, um, they were, became redundant, but then well, what was called hulked and they were actually then um, used as a shore base um, for training, for example, um, we'll have another example in a minute, um, and then uh, were broken up and sold. Um, and this actually occurred in the 1920s, Howe and, and uh, Hindustan were both broken up in the early 1920s in London, um, and the timbers purchased for Hall, uh, the whole uh, father and son team, and put into Liberty's store. So again, a good example of ship's timbers. Our third one, I've mentioned it's much, much further from the coast, but of course, by the time we get into the 19th and 20th centuries, it's much, much easier to move timber about um, on the railways, for example, um, or on the canal network, um, or as happened more recently, I guess, by road. Um, here's a, a pub in Brick House. It was built um, in the late 1920s, Originally, as it was called the Prince of Wales, it had a fairly basic refurbishment inside in the 1990s, early 2000s, and they renamed it the Old Ship. Um, but this one is a documented example of ship's timbers. Um, here we have a rough summary of what it is. About. Um, it originally was a ship, and this is the Donegal, um, under full, well, almost full sail um, in, on duty, um, launched in Devonport in 1858. Um, most of its life it spent tra transporting troops around Coast Guard patrols. So those timbers have been to Mexico, China and so on. Um, after what, uh, nearly 30 years um, in service, it was hulked and then used as um, a torpedo school um, as the location for it, not as a target, I would say. Um, and then it eventually broken up in Portsmouth by a firm called Pounds. Um, there were a number of these specialist firms um, engaged in shipbreaking um, near the naval dockyards um, and the timber was sold off and then the timbers were moved um, up to Yorkshire um, and they were incorporated in this building or rather incorporated they formed the basic structure or a basic structure of this building certainly the front of it um, and they were carved by a chap called Harry Percy Jackson um, and he's an interesting chap, you may know that I'm also fascinated by building craftsmen um, and uh, Harry Percy Jackson happened to be one of the people um, in the local area that I became very interested in. Here he is in his workshop standing outside his house. Unfortunately, you can't see what's in that arch, but he called his house Morris Cot as um, an, a, a recognition of the person, one of the people that had inspired him. And here he is um, working on, actually here, working on a piece of church. Um, decoration or church, uh, I think it's a rood screen for a church. Um, he was also involved in a second building, that tap, the one with the Tap and Spile and Royal Oak uh, in Halifax. So there are four examples. There are other ones, um, some very interesting examples, and um, I won't have time really to go into them at the moment, but uh, there we have um, three examples in England and a couple in Scotland. Um, they, the top two, and these two also have the uh, <clears throat> a distinction that they're, they're quite near the water, but almost all of them are also, I think, fairly recent additions. I'm not 
the Scottish ones I don't know very much about, um, so I may, they may be older examples. The Chesapeake Mill, <coughs> very interesting name for a mill, it takes it from the ship which was broken up, happened to be an American ship, um, which uh, came over to Hampshire um, and was uh, repurposed as a mill, and still there, you can go and visit it. Um, the second one uh, was the result of some investigations in a, a house in Robin Hood's Bay and they discovered some timbers with these names on um, and there's a whole website devoted to the investigation that led to them finding out an enormous amount about the Elizabeth Jane which is uh, you know we're not on the same scale at all we're not on a on the warship uh, level we're at a much much smaller one and uh, the Royal Oak I mentioned already another warship and then these two buildings in Scotland I've only recently found references to them <clears throat> so they are, are buildings uh, that also incorporate ships timbers two days ago or three days ago I had a, <laughs> an interesting inquiry um, someone had seen that uh, I was doing this talk um, and they said would this possibly be a mast from a ship. Now I must admit I haven't come across many examples um, of masts being reused, um, although I think earlier in the year or perhaps last year uh, James Wright is um, an archaeologist, buildings archaeologist, who also does talks like this would be um, worth having a look at, um, are, uh, had identified a, a reused mast in a building um, and I, the people who sent me this suggested that this, although it's in a windmill now, um, could well be a reused mast. And they said one of the main reasons they think this could be a mast, apart from its shape and you know, it does look like a ship's mast, is that in most cases um, the central post here, um, or it's not really a post, it's a driving mechanism, um, could has a squared so, or, or, you know, as you would expect, a trunk is much more trouble to go make a, a circular timber like this, I would have thought. And here are the people that did it. They got asked about it and they would love to hear if anyone has got other examples. Photo comes from um, their collection by Nick Ansell. And I just found this little drawing to illustrate exactly how it looks in some mill. This is that timber we were looking at. And as you can see, it's driven by, well, I mean, it's a very simplified drawing and probably not accurate for Holgate Mill, but it just gives you the idea. We have the windmill here with its sails and the drive is transferred by these cogs down to the central drive, which goes down to the stones, or sort of driving the stones. Um, you can visit the mill in better times, but you can also support them um, by buying their flour as well. And I, um, I've actually only been to the outside of the mill, but I'd say that's 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 a good way of supporting someone um, if we're looking at uh, ways in which we can perhaps ameliorate the course of, co of COVID. So that's really my summary, my summary about the ship's timbers. But when I was doing this research, going on for about 10, 15 years now, I came across a lady with my name, Serena Kant, another Kant, member of the Kant family, although there are no connections. And she has done a lot of research and published a book called England's Shipwrecked Heritage. Um, for historic England. So I hope you found that interesting. I hope it's found, I, I hope it's given you the confidence to go along and um, be able to convince householders that perhaps these aren't ship's timbers um, and then be able to give them a kind of a, um, some sensible reasons as to why these not made of these ship's timbers. Um, I did pose a kind of question at the beginning that, I mean, if you do meet a householder and the householder is determined that these are ship's timbers and you want to record that building, of course you back off and okay, yes, okay, if you think these are ship's timbers, and you, but you point out to them that this is indeed a very popular myth indeed. There we go, thank you very much. <laughs>